Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Jason Jedlica, and we're going to be speaking about what we're teaching in the optometry schools on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Before we get started with our conversation with Dr. Despedidas, I wanted to say thank you to Oculus for their support of this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Uh, Oculus does an incredible job with axial length and corneal measurements for your specialty lens or your myopia practice. Again, thanks to Oculus for their support of this episode. Well, thanks again. We are so excited to be here with Dr. Jason Jedlica. Jason, it's good to see you as always. Great to be here with you, Dave. Yeah, I'm stoked to have you on the podcast to talk about um, this topic around students and so forth. But for those people who don't know where you're at, everybody knows your name, share a little bit about where you're at and what you do. Sure. So yeah, after 17 years in private practice, um, I moved on to Indiana University about nine years ago and joined the faculty and I oversee our contact lens service here. So I get to teach the students um, a couple different classes and then clinical education as well. Um, so my life is all about teaching contact lenses, myopia, you know, vision correction, et cetera. And I really love it. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, Jason and I have lectured uh, various places together, which is, you know, absolute joy. And uh, I've always looked on with admiration on many of the things that you've done, both in the scleral lens, but also the myopia world. Um, you know, I have this concern with regards to myopia management not being as big as we need it to be. Mm -hmm. The reality is if there's 3 million myopes in the United States, children with myopia, which I think is a gross under exaggeration of what it really is, that would require 10,000 practitioners to be seeing 300 myopia management patients a year. Now, yeah. the myopia management numbers that we have is that if you did 300, you would be a huge myopia management practice. Um, I, I, that torch needs to be picked up by practitioners of every age, but it just seems to be that we need to be changing our approach. And one of those approaches is at the schools. Beings that you've been a myopia management specialist for your entire career, how, uh, how are you seeing in academia this shifting? Some schools further ahead than others, right? Berkeley's got a whole myopia clinic. You know, different schools are opening clinics. You've been doing it for a long time. Share with me a little bit of the state of myopia management education at the schools as you look far and wide, we don't need to point anybody out, but what, what, you know, where are we at right now? And we'll talk later about where, where we're going to be in five years. Sure. Yeah. I think probably each of the schools does it a bit differently. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'll just speak for how we run things at Indiana. And I know that it's different because I've been to other schools and seen how they do. Um, we, I personally have been an advocate of myopia management for as long as I've been here. We yeah. have a lot of fourth okay lens fitting and a lot of referrals from the outside, but you know, our own pediatric service where, you know, of course being in private practice for years, I generated my own myopia management patients. But now that I'm in a clinic where pediatrics is its own separate clinic and I don't see children other than those that are being sent in for contact lenses. Um, it's, it's a different scenario, but really what's been huge for us is back when my site got approved in 2019, our pediatric department at IU got fully on board with the whole idea of this is something we need to be doing. And so they are extremely proactive in our, in our pediatric service at talking about and managing myopia with with every child who comes in and and that's that's been you know amazing now 
what's different and, and it's and it's changed for us is that you know now we get so many more referrals for ortho k hmm. but our pediatric clinic does a lot of the basic management of that myopic patient so they're going to do their annual exams with a binocular vision component which i think is is helpful in a lot of these myopic children they're going to be doing the axial length measurements, the choroidal thickness measurements with OCT, et cetera, because we're, we want to be practicing that myopia management as fully as we can for the experience of our students. They need to see what comprehensive myopia management looks like so they can decide, is this something that I can embrace or want to or whatnot? And so from a contact lens service, our, our referrals have just exploded exploded from our own pediatric service, which is fantastic. Um, and it's become a collaborative effort now managing these students. So we, you know, we get a little bit of a double dipping in the curriculum because we talk a little bit of myopia management in our contact lens classes because contact lenses are a huge part of it, both soft and ortho. Okay. Um, but then also in our pediatrics curriculum now talks myopia management as part of the pediatrics curriculum. So they'll talk about development of myopia, et cetera. Uh, and all of that is part of our pediatrics curriculum. And so we, we, me and um, Katie Connolly, who's chief of our pediatrics service here, um, we share our notes and go over and make sure that we're trying not to duplicate too much, but we make sure we cover myopia fully from all perspectives so that our students see the whole, whole picture of, of that myopia is not, you know, it's not just a refractive error. It's, it's not just about, um, it's not just about a child becoming myopic. It's about a child whose axial length may be growing even as they change from a plus 150 to a plus 75. The disease is already happening even before they become myopic and, and starting mm -hmm. to recognize that part of it. So we're, yeah, we're doing our best to open up the eyes of our, of our students to the whole concept of axial length growth, myopia, measuring it, monitoring it, uh, managing it. And, um, you know, from that perspective, I think they see, they see. So, you know, we have a, a, a young man come in a, a few days ago in the clinic who's um, 14 years old now, been in myopia management for five years. And we look back and say, my gosh, your, your base curve and your ortho lens hasn't changed in five years. Mm -hmm. That means you're basically stable for five years. And so the students see like, well, that's amazing. You know, so even though they are not here long enough to see long term, well, I fit a child and I see them three, four years later, they're, they're getting to see children have been managed now for years and they see that it works. Yeah. So you, at the time of this recording, you've just recently got together or the contact lens educators got together. I don't know if you were there um, in Actually, Chicago. Was not, but yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So as you've talked with other people at the school and so forth, what, what do you see as a general trend in education outside of IU? Are you seeing that movement starting to work and in starting to take hold or it's still sl sluggish? Yeah. You know, I, I feel like most most every situation, the contact lens educators at the schools are on board with this. I don't see that there's any place where, where anyone's still holding out to the idea that this isn't legit, that this isn't a real thing, part of our practice. I think there may be still some gaps in integrating with the pediatrics people. I mean, because again, if in most schools, I would think, most of your children under the age of 10, 12 are coming into pediatrics as their primary entry point into the clinic. And so that's who is really, I think the key part of this is to, for the contact lens folks to get on board and pull the pediatrics docs into this idea that, hey, either, either you embrace this and you take it and we'll help with the contact lens management part, or... Mm -hmm. You see it, and if you don't want to do the prescribing of whatever contact lenses or atropine or in the near future, spectacle lenses, 
then refer them over to us and we'll take it from there. But let's not miss the opportunity. And, and that's got to come from our pediatrics folks, really. And, and it hasn't been in the past. In the past, it's been a lot of uh, heavily based in our contact lens services, I think. Yeah. Because that was the main ways of managing it. Um, yeah. But as atropine prescribing has grown as we're going to have other options. Again, I think I think our pediatrics docs have got to be the ones to say, we embrace this and we will um, we'll take the lead on this and, and we'll keep our contact lens practitioners involved. But a lot of, you know, in the last three, four years, our, con our, our pediatric resident at the school has learned how to do ortho K and all the other contact lenses so that as they leave, they're fully capable of comprehensive myopia management from day one walking out. So sure. we, do, we do work with that pediatric resident to try to get them experienced in the more specialty lens aspects as well, because that's going to be part yeah. of the pediatric practitioner's future. Yeah. Or they're going to work with somebody else who does. Who does it. Yeah. So Jason, the, um, the reality is when somebody graduates and let's say they go into primary care practice, um, what primary care means is you're doing comprehensive eye exams you're managing some glaucoma or at least detecting it. You're, you know, managing some macular disease or at least detecting that something's wrong. And like, there's this, this level. And within that contact lenses fit there, right? Sphere, toric, sure. soft multifocals. You're going to, you're going to do some of that and you're going to fit that. But myopia management still seems to be one of those things where it's a specialty service right? It's, you know, scleral lenses for regularly shaped eyes are still seen as a specialty service, right? Um, beyond giving artificial tears, dry eye seems to be a specialty service. And those of us who are in those things are trying to pull them into more primary care. And there's some people, what is it that is going to help us get myopia management from the schools to be seen as more mainstream, make it more comfortable in the primary care. Your pediatric people seem to be a, a big key to that. Is it axial length? Like what is the piece? Well, so I, I think, um, you know, the, the thing, and you talked about this all and, and, and everybody, talks the idea of, well, it'd be great to specialize or have a special, you know, doing specialty lenses or, or a disease focus on my practice. I really love glaucoma. I really want to build a glaucoma practice. And, and all those things are great, but they, but you have to, you have to acquire certain types of patients to do that. And a lot of practices aren't just rife with thousands of glaucoma patients necessarily, but every practice has myopic children in it. And mm -hmm. so every practice has the ability to be managing that as a specialty now. But like you said, it really shouldn't be a specialty. I, I completely think, I completely think that A, when, um, when myopia, myopia managing spectacle lenses are approved, when we have a, a version of atropine 0.05 or 0.025% that's prescribable through any pharmacy out there because it's branded and made by one of the bigger drug companies, um, I think it will become far more, you know, a mainstream in terms of practice. I think, I think what holds people back now is that you look at the, the core group of patients that really need the most aggressive management. That's that five to 10 year old group, right? Um, those are the folks who are going to progress the fastest most of the time. Well, for the average practitioner, that's not a specialty lens person like you or I, they may feel a little funny about putting a six-year-old in soft disposable lenses. They may feel a little uncomfortable fitting a six-year-old in an ortho K lens, but what they don't feel uncomfortable with is putting that child in spectacle lenses now. Okay. And so if there was a myopia managing spectacle lens, I think it would happen now. I, I think the challenge becomes is just the comfort level of a lot of practitioners with opening up that door of 
putting that child who's five, six, seven, eight, nine years old in contact lenses, that there's this, maybe there's concern of a safety profile, or maybe there's concern over, I don't want to invest the time and I don't have the time to be doing insertion removal with all these kids and all these follow-ups. Um, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because they see that that would really increase the volume of appointments in their practice and they're not capable of handling it, you know? Um, but I, I think that, again, within our schools right now, the nice thing is that all of our students are getting to see contact lens management of myopia firsthand. They're all rotating through our contact lens service. And we see people every day, sometimes, you know, five, six, eight kids a day coming through our contact lens service that are in myopia managing contact lenses and they're seeing it. So I have no doubt that, that the, if you look at the graduating class of this last May, compared to the graduating class of May five years ago, it's going to be exponentially more people are going to be jumping into myopia management from day one because they've already practiced it. They practiced yeah. it now. They already did it in, in their education. They don't have to learn it. They know how to do it. Yeah. Well, I've, I've said that the, the, the reality is that, that myopia is uh, it, it, the lack of its success has not been the lack of reasonable products or treatments. It's been the lack of, of calling a disease. And I have to then circle us back to axial length because it seems that as we know more about axial length, which has not been something optometry has been taught in the past. Um, you know, I remember learning about it, but that was just to calculate, you know, IOLs for, for cataract patients. And that's all I really cared about it for, uh, or, uh, doing, doing ray tracing in first year of optometry right. school. That was right. the other thing we learned about it. But it seems that as we have more axial length available to us, we're realizing that if you're under 26 millimeters, you've got a 3.8% chance of developing a, a visual impairment of 2060 or worse. But if that goes above 26, now you've got a 25% risk. And if that goes above 30, you've got a 90% risk. And as we start talking with our pediatric practitioners who historically have been about pediatric disease today, and if we talk about, hey, it's your job to keep it from happening in the future, and if we can get them on board at the schools, them, them saying is like, yeah, we've got to, like you've done, we've got to get those kids over. And if the students start seeing that and start seeing, hey, we've got to stop this, right? We're learning about glaucoma. We're learning about retinal disease. We're learning about all these things and we can stop it from happening. We can turn the funnel off because when you're in practice, you're just working on solving the problems of the worst case scenarios. It seems that as that education continues, like you said, that five years from now, if that message remains strong, We'll be at a place where those 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 students and those uh, graduates are are going to be crushing it in the myopia world. Would you agree? They have to. They have to because they are hearing it. And and you know, again, we come back to the disease part of it. There's not a person out there who, if they had a patient walk in the office and their pressure was 26 and their cup to the disc was. 0.6 with some inferior thinning that even with a clean visual field, we would never just let that patient walk. You know, you would never say, well, we'll just watch this for a while and see what happens. We know that glaucoma, you've got what, 50% optic nerve loss before you even start to touch upon a visual field defect. You don't wait till there's a problem. You diagnose it and, and you treat it early. And this is the exact same thing. And so We've just got to get our, our ourselves around this idea that um, axial length growth is not a good thing. And again, I think that the concept of this whole idea of axial length as a key component is something like you said, that wasn't probably taught five years ago or 10 years ago for sure, um, other than the class where you learn optics, but now it is. And um, you know, again, even even if you don't have a biometer, um, 
just like you said from class you you know how to figure out the axial length of an eye roughly speaking by knowing their refractive error in their case so do. that, um, that yeah. does bring value now huh <laughs> it does right see so you never thought you'd use that and here we are now saying well either buy a biometer or get your formula out and figure it out but again it, it really just it it comes back to the awareness that a child who's even again that child who's plano or plus a quarter um and a lot of practices are doing auto keratometry on their kids all the time if I saw a kid come in who was a plus a quarter and their K's were 40.50, I would be concerned about that kid because mm -hmm. that's already a long eye, even though he's still basically amotropic. And if yeah. that kid starts down the myopia pathway, if next year he's the minus 50, this is someone who needs myopia intervention soon, you know, especially if the family history is there and, and whatnot. So, um, this is the sort of thing that, you know, we want to open up the eyes of our students to, to come to the realization that, yeah, maybe you don't have all the tools in your practice right now, walking out of here into your first practice setting. Maybe you don't have all the tools to be that comprehensive myopia management practice. Just like, just like maybe you don't have a scleral topographer, but you can still fit a scleral lens. You know, maybe you don't have a biometer. It's not an excuse. You, you have capability. Yeah to detect when someone's at risk and you can, you can, you can manage it. You again, is it better yeah. to have a biometer and all that for sure, but it's not critical. It's just something that as you grow your myopia practice and, and you start really getting forward thinking about managing myopia, you're going to want those tools, just like you want an OCT if you want to be a good glaucoma practice. Yeah. But I would say, you know, I, uh, you know, in five years, I think we'll, our perspectives around this will be very different is when, when, uh, when I, you and I graduated optometry school, we managed glaucoma with uh, pressures and, you know, there were some very rudimentary instruments that were available to us, but fast forward that 10 years later, uh, those students that were graduating were like, why would you manage glaucoma without an OCT? It's like, that seems to be the thing that we need to do. So today versus five years from now, schools are going to need to take that importance value on the uh, uh, axial length and, and help drive that that is a best of care. And so that when you do graduate, you join a practice that doesn't have it you know, it's on the hot list within that first year or two uh, to, to get something that'll help you better manage it, particularly as it becomes more uh, standard of care. And my fear around it is that when spectacle lenses come out, we may slide back into the early days of myopia management, where all we were doing is managing refractive error, and it went up by a quarter or a half. And you know, not a big deal, but the reality was the axial length is increasing and we're not really paying attention to that because they're not looking at the case, right? So, you know, that's how I managed myopia for years. But now that I do have a biometer, it's really helping to manage myopia. And that's my hope is that if you are managing it with a, a more accessible atropine or uh, spectacle lenses, that you're also tracking that, right? hundred percent because because again you you've got just like any other disease you've got more aggressive forms and and more mild forms and you may have that child who uh who you've put in spectacle lenses for myopia management and like you said maybe they're still progressing a little bit well you you've got to make the decision at some point to say look this axial length was already longer to begin with I, I need dual therapy. I can't mm -hmm. just have this person in glasses only because it's not slowing things enough. Yeah. And that's that's where that's where biometry comes in because like you said at the beginning, if that child's eye, if they're a minus three and they're already at 26 and a half, 27 millimeters, my level of, of concern and aggressiveness of my management is altogether different than if that child's a minus three and their axial length is 23.8. Right. It's a big difference and, and changes if you don't, things. It, yeah. And, and so, and that, here's another thing that goes back to is, is again, once you put a child in like ortho K, if that's your, your modality of choices, you are not going to get K's in, you know? So you, how are you going to track? And you can't really judge refractive error that reliably on an ortho KI. 
no. you've got to do some biometry. And the, the good news is, is that so many of the companies out there now with biometers, and there are more of them, you know, all of the, all the big companies that make equipment, you know, they, mm -hmm. or at least a lot of them are, are adding biometers and myopia management tools accessible to the optometric practice. They're often giving them to the schools at a greatly reduced price or whatnot. So I do think that, you know, again, because of that fact, the students coming out are going to have access or they're going to have experience with biometry as a part of myopia management. And then again, they're going to walk out into practice and not have it and go, gosh, I, I missed that, you know, because right. they see the value. And so that's yeah. kind of the hope I think is, is that, you know, again, we've got 75, 80 students that come through our program every year, you know, for, for a company to put an instrument in to a school, either, either, on loan for a while or on lease at, or, you know, some kind of a rate, which allows that instrument to sit at the school and get used. Then, then the, again, the pediatrics department to me has got to jump on using that thing on every kid, not just for the benefit of the kids, but for the benefit of the students to see yeah. how to add that to their, to their myopia practice. Yeah. And it needs to be in the pediatric clinic, not just the contact lens clinic, right? And yeah, so we don't even have a biometer in our contact lens clinic. Luckily, we're literally on the same floor right down the hall from pediatrics, so I can use it anytime. I just have to walk down to the pediatric clinic, but mm -hmm. ours sits in our pediatrics clinic because that's where it's used 90% of the time. Yeah. That's excellent. And that's, that's really where it should be. Um, I, I just think, again, I would love it if our if our schools, if our, my, our pediatrics clinics would jump on the myopia management integrate with their contact lens clinics and, and, you know, form an alliance to really get on this and, and manage it well and be an example to every student coming through to see how it can be done. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I love talking the long and the short of myopia management with you. <laughs> it's very good. Uh, thanks for, thanks for hanging out with me and chatting with me. It was good. It's good. It's always a pleasure, Dave. Yeah. And do you have a podcast that you're doing once in a while too? Uh, well, you know, we have this little shindig we do with uh, Craig Norman, the May I Interrupt podcast. It's pretty, pretty laid back, pretty lighthearted. Um, but we have had some amazing guests and um, it is fun in, you know, kind of a lighthearted way to, to get into what makes people tick both personally and professionally. So yeah, that is available on YouTube. It's available on Spotify. It's available a lot of places. So may I interrupt? A I E Y E interrupt. Yes, it's it 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 is a great podcast. And so thank you for for mentioning it. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for future episodes with amazing guests like our friend Jason Chedlicka. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.